Do we have the participants in China Center? Yes. Beijing is here. Okay. Okay, good. Dong Yi. Thank you. How are you, Zubadu? Fine, thank you. Yeah, since we are still uh, some participants uh, is on the way. Okay, I hope that they will be there in next one minute. Yes. Well, before we start formally, I want to remind everybody that when someone is not speaking, the microphone should be turned off. Please remember, and when someone is speaking, microphone phone should be turned on. And immediately when speaking finishes, please turn off the microphone. All the time, please remember this. Welcome to Polycom Conference Recorder Playback Service. Tokyo Center, did something happen in the technology? Sorry, we just started the recording. So uh, please start at any time. Uh, okay. Whenever it's thank you okay, so much. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Maybe, maybe it looks like almost all centers have participants seated, and we have uh, we have everybody ready. Maybe one or two participants are on their way in some centers, but we are going to start it now. Uh, before we start, I wanted to tell you that this is a regional event, event of the World Bank's East Asia Pacific region. Our Vice President of the East Asia Pacific region is at this moment in Vietnam. Uh, so we, we expect him to come uh, to, uh, to join us briefly for four or five minutes, uh, five, six minutes. Um, but we don't know. Probably it will happen about 8 a.m., between 8 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. London time, which is um, Vietnam time between 2 and 2.30 p.m. So as Jim Adam, our Vice President for East Asia and Pacific Region comes, we'd like to request him to um, briefly, uh, to give a brief talk um, to, the, uh, to the participants, and then again we will resume our, our normal um, um, activities. I want to welcome all of you to this training of trainer programs program on international financial reporting standards. This is a, um, a regional event. The purpose is to start the process of developing a, a core group of IFRS experts in all countries in this region. Now, initially, we have started this program with six countries. Six countries have been connected, Thailand, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and Mongolia. The purpose of this program is to help the participants to gain exposure to the practical application of IFRS. Now, we have this program is not only GDLN based. Please remember that this is a program which combines, this methodology of this program combines, combines self-learning, self-learning tutor support from London by using internet and GDLN workshops. So if somebody thinks that participating in seven GDLN workshops will be enough, that is not true. If 
you want to continue with this program, you have to participate in the whole program, which includes self-learning, communicating with the, with the tutors back in London. Tutor support, tutoring support is going to be provided by Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. They are sitting in London, and today they will be leading the technical discussion and providing technical support to this program. The ultimately, ultimately, when we finish our, our participants complete learning, then there will be an exam. And after the exam, there, there will be a certificate provided by the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales to the successful participants. And the successful participants, the certificate holders, will become part of a network, part of a network of IFRS experts in this region. Later on, we may we will try to expand it to other regions and develop a, a group of IFRS experts and networking arrangements amongst them so that um, arrangements can be made for updating IFRS knowledge of the members of this network. So it's this training is not going to finish with this training. It is going to continue um, and the people, the, the participants of this training program uh, should take part in rolling out training on IFRS in respective countries. And we will work with the institutions in respective countries that nominated the participants with the help of those institutions, we will try to work together for rolling out training programs within the country on IFRS. We will provide support, but, but the rolling out has to, be, has to be sponsored by the institution concerned within the country, but we will provide as much support as possible. I do not want to talk much now. I want to invite Raymond Madden, Executive Director of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales to make a brief presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Zubadir, for those uh, helpful introductory words. Um, so that you're clear who um, I am, I'm Raymond Madden, the Executive Director for Learning and Professional Development at the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales and we're here wishing you a good afternoon from London. Um, we're very honored here at the Institute to be um, offering this IFRS program. I think uh, many of you will have read the importance of financial reporting standards, how they're affecting multinational organizations, how they're affecting um, both east and west parts of the globe, and I think it's very important that uh, we have a skill set um, both within the World Bank, but also within agencies, donors, uh, firms, and also, of course, in the university sector. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, joining us over the next uh, few hours 130 participants, as Zubadia said, from uh, a number of countries in the Southeast Asian region. And I think it's very important that we're trialing this in Southeast Asia because we're looking to uh, essentially use this as a model for the World Bank. I think the important part of the Train the Trainers program is that we're looking for principal concepts and knowledge so you are able to promote this to networks within uh, your region, your country, and it's very important that you come up to speed with the skills that we're trying to impart here to, to today and on, on an ongoing basis. The other important thing from the GDLN network is the um, community of interest in, in IFRS. Uh, for those of you who've been involved in this area, you'll find that um, IFRS standards and uh, change and develop, and I think it's important that we have a network that allows us to continue this on an ongoing basis. And uh, keeping up to date with knowledge is incredibly important. What we'd like, hopefully, for those of you who 
um, can take the final assessment, which will be in the order of one month after the final session. So we're mixing tutor support, webinar, and video conferencing. But about one month after, there will be an opportunity to take a, an assessment, which we would actively encourage you to take as uh, uh, tutors, because I think actually assessing yourself is a very much an important part of this. And I think having competence across the skill set in IFRS is important. Um, workshops here are listed and we'll, we're going to provide you with ongoing support as we did yesterday and as we will do after the formalized sessions that you will hear this afternoon. So really that's the, the introduction from uh, me. Uh, I'd now like to hand back to Zubadir and just say once again, Zubadir, that we're uh, delighted and honored to be offering this for the uh, World Bank in the Southeast Asian region. Thank you, Raymond. Now I want to invite Iraj Thalai, Manager for National Management, East Asia and Pacific region of the World Bank. I want to tell you that this program that we are launching today is the result of the, um, of the vision that Iraj Talai had for, for some time now. And he, because of his initiative that we have been able to start this program today. Iraj. Thank you, Zubaydur. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, participants, uh, I am delighted to be here today uh, participating in, in this one step of uh, several steps of this program, which is a pilot program for East Asia and Pacific region. Uh, I'm very happy to see that we could bring together 130 uh, uh, of uh, professionals of six countries and uh, would like to uh, wish you uh, luck and uh, uh, good continued uh, deliberation and participation so that you reach the, uh, uh, the point of certification to obtain the certificate from the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants of, in England and Wales, uh, who has generously and kindly uh, participated uh, and uh, has expressed the commitment to continue this program with us. Uh, this pilot program, as uh, other um, speakers mentioned, um, uh, is not only uh, sessions, uh, involves only sessions uh, of uh, uh, video conference at, via GDLN, but it has the training material and support from uh, facilitators and uh, tutors and uh, self-study uh, and um, through an uh, email program that needs to be uh, uh, followed and uh, uh, and uh, the study of each individual is very important. Um, I would like to also mention that the, uh, the um, certificate means to you, uh, once you obtain the certificate, it means your commitment to continuing uh, the program uh, with us and among the community of practice that we are hoping to develop. Uh, in this region and around the world. Uh, your commitment would be in two ways. One, to commit yourself to keep up with the changes. As you know, the international standards and the situation and circumstances of, uh, of the sector uh, changes and the standards are revised and issued. You have to keep up with that. And the secondly, um, your commitment by accepting the certificate is to continue the program with us as uh, mentors and uh, to help others in your countries uh, to learn and to participate in events that we will organize every now and then to come together with other professionals and experts around the world and especially from our region and beyond to exchange experiences, exchange views, and move the, uh, the international standards uh, beyond the, what they are today. Uh, I want to finish by saying that 
the World Bank uh, has done through its uh, uh, program of ROSCs, has done many diagnostic works under the guidance and uh, supervision of Mr. Rahman, who today is uh, organizing and running this uh, program with, uh, with the, the Institute. Um, and uh, as his reports and the reports that he supervised uh, show, the very important step of uh, adopting the international standard is only the first step. The more important and more difficult one is to understand them, apply them, and uh, practice them, uh, use them in your day-to-day -day practices. Uh, I wish you all the best and good deliberations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Iraj. Before, before I hand over to the uh, tutor back in London, I want, to, I want to remind everybody that this program has, this program has facilitators or, or coordinators in each of these countries where we are um, holding this workshop today. So in China, we have Yi Dong, Indonesia, Rajat Narula, Mongolia, Masha, Philippines, Agnes, Albert Lod, Thailand, Nipa, Siri Budamas, and Vietnam, Jennifer Thompson. I am telling the, I'm requesting the participants in each of these countries to keep in touch with these coordinators. You already know them, probably. If not, please make an effort to keep in touch with these coordinators, because at the end of the program, when there will be an examination, uh, that examination will be coordinated by these coordinators. So they need to keep in touch with you too. Now I am handing over to Gavin Askden in London. Um, he is the uh, instructor representing Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. I'm requesting Gavin to start the uh, instructional program. Good morning, or good afternoon, everyone, should I say. It's morning here in London. Um, I know it's afternoon with all of you. Can everybody see me okay? Can you give me a wave just so you, know you can, you can uh, hear me? Yeah, I've got one person waving out of uh, all 130. That's good. That's more like it. Okay, well, good afternoon. Um, the way I'll be delivering these sessions is uh, pretty much what you see now. I'll be here talking, waving my arms around, and, and basically doing a bit of a song and dance routine for you. Um, in addition, you've already got the course material, so I'll be working fairly closely through uh, the course material. In addition to that, I don't have any um, sort of PowerPoint slides, but what I do have is um, a computer that I can write on the screen. So I just want to do a quick um, select test. Uh, basically, can you all read what is on my screen at the moment? Can you all read the good afternoon? Again, a wave would be good at this point. Yeah, can everyone read that okay? Yeah? Excellent. That's brilliant then. Right. Oops, main camera, back again. Okay, so the objective of this session and the one that we'll be following sort of immediately afterwards is to introduce some of the core topics and some of the things that we're going to be uh, sort of like working through together. In addition to that, there is an element of home study. Now, first of all, uh, I don't sort of recognize any faces at the moment, but obviously I had uh, email conversations with a number of you yesterday morning, which was fantastic. I hope you found that useful, um, going through the pre-course assessment. We will be issuing the solutions to the pre-course assessment uh, once the final couple of them are in and we've had a chance to look through them. Um, in addition to that, there's the home study. Now, in terms of your notes, uh, the home study chapters are uh, chapters 1, 2, 3, 6, 9, 18, and 23. So just to cover that first of all, um, chapter 1, which deals with the financial reporting context, um, that would serve as background information for you to just understand where IFRS fits in uh, sort of with the rest of society, if you like. We then talk about the IFRS framework. Now, even though this is a home study chapter, it is absolutely vital that you cover this fairly soon. I, I wouldn't, for example, want you to be on um, sort of like the, 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 the second set of days, having not really gone through that. And I would anticipate that you may well have a couple of questions, because the framework is the bedrock of all things financial reporting. 
And a full understanding and comprehension of that will actually help a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about make a lot more sense to you. So the actual uh, framework document is very important, especially, and if I can draw your attention to those areas which are to do with recognition. And now recognition is literally just debits and credits. At what point do you actually update your ledger accounts? So we recognize something by debiting or crediting it, and we de-recognize something by debiting and crediting, as I'm sure most of you know. And also the definitions of assets and liabilities. IFRS is fundamentally built on a principle of substance rather than legal form. Now substance is literally uh, the economic realities of a situation. For example, let's say for example I had an animal and I was trying to identify what that animal was. And it had a certificate that said it was a chicken. Okay? Now if I see that animal swimming and I hear that animal quacking, then I'm going to think to myself, hang on a minute, that's not a chicken, that's a duck. Now, under some forms of financial reporting uh, frameworks, such as US GAAP, in the US, uh, they would say, hang on, its paperwork says it's a chicken, so therefore, we look at it as a chicken. Whereas under IFRS, we would say, it might have paperwork saying it's a chicken, but fundamentally, it is behaving like a duck. So we would treat it as a duck. Okay? Now, it might seem slightly silly to be talking about a very serious subject like IFRS, and talking about chickens and ducks. But I think it emphasizes the difference between substance bar rather than form. And the framework introduces this concept, and we'll be seeing far more of it as we go through um, so like the, the rest of this course. The next chapter is on presentation of financial information. And this, again, would be home study simply because it's learning what a uh, balance sheet looks like, what an income statement looks like, what a cash flow statement looks like. And so, therefore, it's formats and basic contents. And so you would need to be familiar with those for the real world. Uh, obviously, for the purposes of the assessment, um, should you decide to do that, and that's a multiple choice. And so formats tend not to arise um, sort of in an examinable manner. However, it is very important that you're comfortable with the different uh, sort of formats and contents. Other things that we want you to cover is inventories. Inventories being sort of the stuff in your warehouse that you're going to be selling. And there really are very simple rules surrounding that, and pretty much they're the same all over the world, with slight differences between IFRS and US GAAP. The basic principle is that you carry them at the lower of the cost and the net realizable value, or fair value, less cost to sell. So again, we would appreciate it if you could work through that chapter, um, which is uh, chapter six in your own time. Uh, chapter nine deals with government grants. And again, grants themselves are very straightforward in terms of accounting treatment. And as you read through it, all you need to do, and it's worth making a note of this now, that the basic principle to accounting for grants is follow the money. Now, what I mean by follow the money is that if it is a revenue-based grant, then the revenue side will be going through the income statement, and therefore the grant goes through the income statement. If the grant relates to a capital item, for example a building, and you're being given a, a grant to build a building in a depressed area, then your asset is going on the balance sheet, in which case the grant goes on the balance sheet as well. Okay? Now, like I say, when you read through the chapter on grants, that will probably make a little bit more sense. But if you're struggling with it, like I say, just remember, follow the money. Okay? We then moved on to uh, so like chapter uh, sort of, uh, 18, which is the next home study chapter, which relates to events after the balance sheet date. Now, whilst this is a home study chapter, we will be covering part of it when we do the work on provisions and contingent liabilities, because the two things are fairly closely related. However, the detail of IAS 10 uh, will need to be covered as home study. And then finally, interim reporting. Interim reporting is one of those standards that it doesn't actually say a great deal. All it does is it builds on the other standards that um, are being created. So the interim reporting chapter 23 is also home study. So just to summarize then, the home study chapters are chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 6, chapter 9, chapter 18, and chapter 23. And we'll be covering all of the other chapters throughout these sessions. So here we are. Let's start off with chapter 4 on accounting policies. Now in your notes, it takes you through uh, sort of the, the introduction. And what I intend to do is to go through those notes and sort of highlight the most important bits and maybe just summarize some of that information for you and help clarify some of the, the more complex areas. So first of all, what is the business context? Well, an accounting policy is fundamentally a choice. And it's a choice made by businesses in order to ensure that we get an element of comparability. Now, when you do your home study and you read through the framework, you'll see that quite a lot of it is made 
of the issue of comparability. Financial statements for one entity and financial statements for another entity should be comparable as well as financial statements for the same entity year after year after year after year. So the idea of accounting policies is it ensures to a degree, because it's not perfect, but to a degree it ensures that we are actually um, producing comparable information. So accounting policies is all about the decisions and the choices that we make. So, to go into a little bit more detail, we need to think about the objectives here. If we want comparability, then therefore there has to be disclosure. For example, if I have two entities, one entity purchased its assets 10 years ago and the other one purchased its assets 10 years ago. And let's say these two businesses are exactly the same in every way. Very unlikely, I know, but let's just assume for the purposes of this example that that's the case. If you have two entities that are exactly the same and their performance is exactly the same, all of their analysis that could be done on the financial statements, you would assume, would show the same results. However, if company A over here happens to revalue its assets okay, and company B doesn't, then the performance information that you're going to get is going to be very different in each case. Things like return on capital employed, earnings per share, gross profit margins, net profit margins, they're going to become very different purely because one entity has revalued its assets and the other one hasn't. Now, there's nothing to say they can't revalue. In fact, IAS 16, as we'll see later on, actually allows you to revalue your assets. So all we have under accounting policies, under IAS 8, is that you are required to disclose that that's what you've done. And there are additional disclosures that come through IAS 16 on property, plants and equipment, which says exactly what details you have to actually disclose. But the basic principles of accounting policy then is to disclose information to make sure that the users of your financial statements can understand some of the decisions that you're making. Now there are many decisions made by accountants which actually don't get disclosed. For example, if you think of inventory and if you think of the way we cost our inventory, you may use allocation, apportionment and absorption of overheads for example. And it may be fairly arbitrary as to how you actually allocate those overheads into the production departments and then absorb them into the inventory. But none of that gets disclosed in our financial statements. So accounting policies, as I said, isn't perfect. The idea is that it gives you additional disclosures about some of the decisions, but please bear in mind there are other decisions that a business will make which won't be actually included in the uh, disclosures of IAS 8. So that brings us on to changes in accounting policies. Now, I'm going to disappear for a second and show you my uh, computer screen. So the situation that we have with our selection of accounting policies is it's all about choice. And when we have choice, we have to consider uh, what constitutes a change in accounting policy. Now, a change in accounting policy comes from two different ways. The first one is if there is a new standard. A new standard, for example, we've recently had um, sort of IFRS uh, sort of 8 and IFRS 7. Each of those requires additional information to be produced. Well, obviously that's new, it has never been done before, and therefore that constitutes a change in accounting policy. Compliance with a new set of rules would constitute a change in accounting policy, and we'll look at exactly what that means in a second. The other reason for a change is because of fairer presentation. Now, I will refer to that on an ongoing basis as an IAS 8 change. The accounts have to be drawn up in a way that shows fair presentation, and that's one of the underlying principles behind it. Now, what exactly is fair presentation? Well, fair presentation is exactly what you might think it is. It's saying that the financial statements are true and fair. It's saying those financial statements are produced in a way that is free from bias and it's free from factual error. Now then, I don't know whether you can see me particularly well, but I'm sure you'll notice that I'm not the skinniest of people on the planet. Um, so let's say I stand on my bathroom scales this morning and they turn around and say that I weigh oh, 50 kilos. Very clearly, some of you can stop laughing, okay? Very clearly, I weigh more than 50 kilos. But if I'm standing on my bathroom scales and they say 50 kilos, you know, uh, an auditor, for example, could turn up and could come in my bathroom, which I would think was a little strange, but an auditor could come in my bathroom, they could look at the set of scales, and they could tick to say that, yes, indeed, the scale said 50 kilograms. The problem is, 
I know I'm not 50 kilograms. I know that I'm quite considerably more than that. So I'm allowing bias to come into my decision making as to whether or not I believe the bathroom scales. Now, fair presentation is that we don't do that. We actually look at that and say, well, hang on. Yes, that's what they say, but I kind of know that that's not actually the truth. So therefore, I ignore it completely, and I go and throw the bathroom scales away, and I go and get another set of scales, and I try again, until I get something that's about right. If I stood on those bathroom scales, though, and it was, say, within one or two kilos of what I thought I weighed, then I would accept it, because it's true in terms of the scales telling me that number, and it's fair because I'm not allowing bias to come into my decision making about whether I believe it or not. So how does that tie in with the standard? Well, the way it ties in is when we're looking at fair representation, we're basically saying that I have not allowed bias to come into those decision making. So the reason why I'm revaluing my financial or uh, uh, my assets is got nothing at all to do with any kind of manipulation and everything to do with the fact that I feel it more fairly presents my financial information. So if I've got very old assets, I might decide to show the impact on my financial statements of their true value and so therefore revalue them. Now, when we start looking at the process of revaluation, what we're really looking at here is three areas. We're looking firstly at recognition. We then look at presentation. And we then look at measurement. Oops. Now, measure, uh, recognition, as I've already said, is all about debits and credits. And debits and credits, as we know, very important, but we debit and credit something to recognize it. So if I change my accounting policy in a way that causes me to debit a different account or credit a different account, then that would constitute a change in accounting policy. So a change in accounting policy arises if we have a change in recognition. So for example, if previously I was expensing my borrowing costs and now I decide to capitalise my borrowing costs, as I am permitted under IS23, then I am therefore changing where I'm debiting and crediting certain items. Previously I would have debited uh, interest expense in my income statement, now I'm going to be debiting the cost of an asset. So I've changed the account that I'm debiting. So that would be a change in recognition. A change in presentation, a change in presentation is one of two things. It's either changing which of my primary statements that I'm putting things in, so balance sheet or income statement. For example, my borrowing costs. Previously, my borrowing costs were appearing in the income statement. Now they're appearing as part of the cost of assets on the balance sheet. So consequently, uh, under IAS 23, that is permitted. It would constitute a change in policy, not only for recognition, but also for presentation. And we only need one of those to create the change in accounting policy. And then we move on to measurement base. Now, measurement is the tricky one. It's the one that causes the most confusion. Okay. The reason it causes the most confusion is because there's something else which is an estimate. And quite often people get confused between which one it is as to whether it's measurement or whether it's an estimation technique. Now the easiest way I've found of thinking about this is the measurement, which is the important one. If you think about how you would explain